Hey, you guys, this is Josh with Homesteading Family, and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat, Food for Thought. We've got an exciting guest today, a friend and mentor of mine, Joel Salatin, and we are going to be talking about starting a homestead business. I am getting more and more questions about how to start a homestead business, and I get it. People are moving to the country, you're looking for an alternative life, and You're looking for an alternative way to make a living as you make that transition. But it is a big step. Just homesteading is a big step. But then starting a business based on maybe some of your homesteading endeavors is another big step. And so we're going to talk about some key things you need to know, how to maybe think like a business person, and talk about some ideas uh, for businesses to get started. And um, like I said, I'm really excited to have Joel here today. So Joel calls himself a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer. Uh, others who like him call him the most farmer, most others who like him call him the most famous farmer in the world. And some of us also call him the grandfather of the modern homesteading movement. With 15 published books and a thriving multi-generational family farm, he draws on a lifetime of food, farming, and fantasy to entertain and inspire audiences around the world. Joel's as comfortable moving cows in a pasture as he is addressing CEOs in a Wall Street business conference. And his speaking and writing reflect dirt under the fingernails experience punctuated with mischievous humor. He passionately defends small farms, local food systems, and the right to opt out of the conventional food paradigm. Four generations of his family currently live and work on Polyface Farm in Swoop, Virginia. Let's welcome Joel Salatin. Hey, Joel, how's it going today? Going great. Thank Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for joining me. Excited to talk to you. And I know folks are excited to learn a little bit about just some some foundationals on starting a business on the homestead. But um, before we get into that, what, uh, what is life like for you on the farm, on the homestead in Virginia right now? Well, of course, we're, we're just breaking to spring here. Uh, we've, we've had, you know, uh, two days of, uh, this is our third day in the last two weeks, so we've hit 60 degrees. And so we've got a little bit of green grass uh, starting to show. And, um, and yeah, it's uh, it's it, it'll be we'll be in full blown uh, uh, whatever crisis mode now for the next what, two weeks as we transition from winter to s- spring and and get animals that are inside get them outside and you know uh, all, all the all the transition stuff that we do at spring it, it'll it'll all hit us here in the next you know three weeks. Yeah, kind of going from uh, from that winter walking maintenance to a full on sprint here. Yeah. 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 Full on, full on sprint. Yeah. Yeah. So it, spring is always my favorite time. You have this kind of dormancy, everything's kind of sleepy. And then, mm. boy, you know, the birds come and the grass grows and, and, you know, everything's having babies. And boy, it's a, you know, it's a really, uh, it's a really exciting time. Yeah, yeah, we're looking forward to that, but of course we're in North Idaho, so we're quite a ways behind you. And we were having a light winter. I'm looking out the window here, and we were we were thinking a couple of days ago. Well, maybe this is it. Maybe winter's done. Yeah, we woke up to four inches of snow this morning, and and uh, so I don't know. Maybe maybe we've still got uh, a month to go. We'll see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we we can uh, we can certainly have some plenty of cold in March as well. Uh, we just don't know where it is, but it's but that that green what i call the green patina in other words the grass isn't really growing but there's a kind of a green sheen on it at least instead of brown and uh so you know chlorophyll's coming back yeah nice when do you like when do you think you'll get cows out into their first rotations i normally normally we're out uh grazing by you know, um, the second half of March. So once March 15 comes, we've normally got enough grass to start, you know, start maybe not grazing everything, but, but, you know, it, 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 obviously they go out in batches, you know, different groups. And, um, normally we can get out then last winter, we had our first group out February 25. We had such a warm, such a warm, 
uh, February, we actually had enough grass to graze and we actually turned some things out on February 25th last year. That's the earliest we've ever, we've ever done it. And we, and we've gone as late as like April 7th. So, you yeah. know, it just, it just totally depends on what kind of um, warmth and moisture, you know, we get like, like today we just, we just had a huge uh, heavy shower um, downpour, but it's, it's 61 degrees out there. So warm rain, warm rain is just about as, as uh, conducive to grass waking up as you can get. All right. Well, it's, it's exciting to see spring coming and yeah. uh, I'd love to talk more cows and grass, but we're going to talk business today. Yeah. Uh, homestead business. There are a lot of people, obviously you're very familiar with this. You're traveling all the time, talking to people all over the country and world and doing conferences. And so I'm sure you're seeing the same things. A lot of people not only adopting the homesteading life, but wanting to find a new way to make an income, to make a living as they make that transition. And I think that's great. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I'm every much business person as I am homesteading. I, I love the principles of it. I think there's a lot of um, intersection in the discipline and the skills you need for a homesteading life and a and an entrepreneurial life. Um, but I think uh, a lot of people don't always realize that. They don't always realize what they're getting into and that that you need to not just learn a skill like you know raising pasture chickens but you need to learn some business skills and some entrepreneurial skills as well. Right. So I'm hoping we'll be able to explore a little bit of that today, but I'd love to just for you to share a few minutes, your story, because most of us that know you know you as a businessman, a farmer an entrepreneur and, and an author and many other things. But I don't think a lot of people maybe realize that you didn't start out an entrepreneur and a business person. And, and, and um, so I'd love to hear the history a little bit of, um how you got started and got into farming uh there on uh, your place in virginia yeah yeah so uh so mom and dad bought this place in 1961 when i was just four years old and um dad 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 wanted to be a full-time farmer he wanted to be a commercial full-time farmer and he actually um got advice he, he brought in you know people from the extension service he he, he hired um Doan management consultants. I mean, he had both private and public people come tell him how we're going to make this small farm uh, um, pay. And everybody's advice was chemical fertilizer, borrow more money, build silos, plant corn, uh, all this stuff. And um, and dad was an accountant. He ran a sharp pencil and he knew that that was not the answer. We, we didn't have, I mean, our farm was a gullied rock pile. That's why we bought it. It was very, very cheap. Think about this, you know, 550 acres, Josh, 550 acres in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia in 1961, a tractor, a hay rake, a mower, a baler, a hay wagon, the house, an equipment shed, a barn, all for $49,000. Oh, my goodness. That's isn't that, yeah. isn't that something. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So one of the reasons that we came here was because the land was so worn out, it was real cheap. Yeah. And, um, and so, so dad tried for a year or two and realized that, that we just, um, but he couldn't figure out. I mean, I, I don't think, I, I don't think at that time with what we knew and, and the state that the farm was in the land, it, it couldn't be done. But um, that early experience made him, uh, um, dedicated to retail sales as a small farm. He said, we cannot compete on volume. We have to compete on margin. So we have to wear the processor, the distributor and the marketer hats, all those middlemen hats. We need to wear those hats. So basically we shut the, he shut the farm down and it was not doing much, you know, at all. And, uh, and took a job in town. Mom started teaching school. Uh, Mom actually took a job off the farm before dad did. He was a stay-at-home, you know, farm mom uh, for a year. And, um, and then they both went out to work and took their salaries and paid the mortgage. And it was paid off in about 12 years. So now the farm's paid for. But through, through the 60s, it was basically a glorified homestead. You know, we, we had a big garden. We milked, milked two Guernsey cows. We made butter and buttermilk and cottage cheese. Um, we, you know, we had a little herd of cows, about, you know, 10 or 12, 10 or 12 head. 
um, raised, you know, two pig, two pigs a year for us to, you know, for us to eat. Um, I had my first chickens when I was 10 and I supplied the family with eggs and that was really, uh, and so the, 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 the calves were sold at the local sales sale barn. Um, the pigs, we, you know, we did ourselves. We had a neighbor that liked butchery. And so he came over and taught us how to field dress a beef and field dress a, a, a pig. And of course, neighbors would do that as well. And, uh, so we, we were basically, you know, we had our own firewood. And so we were, we were essentially, um, eating and, and heat and stuff on our own. Uh, but there was, there was no business. There was no, there was no real economic thing. I, su I suppose at that time selling whatever, five or six calves a year, uh, that probably paid the taxes, you know, but, but, it, but it, it didn't, didn't really do anything uh, else. And, and, and dad devoted those years then to experimentation. He started looking at, at controlled grazing, developing electric fencing system, uh, started, we started composting. We got the wood chipper. Um, and, and, and so by the time I'm in high school, the farm is still not a going concern, but we can start seeing the glimmer of, uh, you know, of, of fertility and, and, um, and opportunity. And, um, uh, so the most important thing to remember is when I was about 14, I, my, my chickens, my chickens, now I'm four years into it and I've got whatever, a couple hundred chickens. And I need an outlet for eggs. And um, I, I was always the, you know, the, the, whatever, the gregarious, um, you know, kind of talker, marketer, whatever. And we had, a, we had an old curb market in Stanton at that time. Now, Stanton is 10 miles away. It's a town of 20,000 people. So it's not real big, but, you know, big enough. And they had started a, a basically a farmer's market in the depression back in the 30s. So that farmers could direct market stuff. And they had an arrangement with the health department that if you if if you were a kid and you were in 4-H or FFA, if you were a woman and you were in home uh, um, extension homemakers clubs, if you were a man and you were in the Cattlemen's Association, so so all these were kind of you know government extension education outfits. If you were joined one of those, the health department would not impose any food safety requirements on you hmm. so i grew up so i started going there when i was about 14 and uh from 14 to 18 we were there uh, it was it was an indoor market and by the time we went there were only two elderly matrons left and in in the 30s and 40s it was there were a hundred vendors i mean it was huge it was it was like a local local walmart you know uh yeah. in, in the day and many farmers actually you know paid their taxes and 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 i mean i i know one lady i mean all the people who are deceased now but i remember her saying that she and her husband were able to build their house from the money she made making pies you know and selling them down at curb market wow why why and, and so, so so when i went it was me and these two elderly matrons they took me under their wing showed me how to message how to deal with customers signage pricing I wouldn't, I get all teary remembering those. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. It was wonderful. Wow. That's an amazing entry, you know, that story. And one of the, one of the things I, I mean, there's a whole lot of little tidbits in there, but one of them, it, it sounds like the farm that what became a successful, you know, your eggs and on to a successful business was born out of years of just kind of homesteading and focusing on yes. providing for yourselves, getting systems working, improving the land. Yes. And there were some natural outcomes, eggs being one of those. There was kind of natural outflows out of those efforts that had synergy probably with your interests, um, what the land could produce, some things like that. Is that a, is that a good lesson yeah. to pull here? Absolutely it is. In fact, uh, in fact, when I was about 16 or 17, I'm in high school, and uh, you know, this is before the homeschooling movement took off. And um, and I'm 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 committed. I I mean, I remember when dad and I had the talk. I was I don't know, 16 or 17. We had it out at the at the dog leg out in the what we call the dog leg. And one of the farm lanes has make, makes a turn It was on a Sunday morning and uh, not Sunday morning. It was it was just an evening, I think. or It was in the morning. It was in the morning for sure. And we had we had the talk and and um, and he asked me, you know, 
what, what, what do you want to do? You know, with, with your life? I said, I want to be here. I want to be here for my life, my vocation. I want to be here. And, and, uh, from that day on, he, he quit, um, he quit investing in things. So if, if we needed, a if we needed something, I started buying things, you know, equipment, um, I would pay for the fixing the roof on the barn, uh, different things. And, um, and he really, he, he really, you know, backed away to let me enjoy the, the front end of that. And, um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I, I make with so many families, you know, on succession and the elder generation, you know, they want to take it to the grave, you know, that they, they, they just, mm. that, 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 you know, that ability to delegate and, and, uh, let the next generation make those decisions is a is a hard thing for for old yeah. old her- hermit curmudgeon farmers to give up and uh but 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 he was he was quick to do so and uh it was it was really foundational but but during those years we did a lot of experimenting we would try things and uh and and those trials then by the time I came back full time September 24, 1982. By the time I came back full time, those experiments, the ones that succeeded, became the foundation for our farm business. The ones that failed protected us from pouring money we didn't have into another rat hole. Yeah. And uh, and and so the off-farm incomes provided a safety net to do some experiments some were costly some were not but they really helped us so that so that 20 years later like i said we came in 61 now we're at september 24 1982 so we're literally 20 years of this of this kind of off farm cushion and experimentation time when we launched we had a lot of experience and experiments under our belt yeah yeah Well, I'm thankful you're here and I'm thankful for the platforms and technology we have because hopefully we can help people accelerate that journey a little bit and, uh, you know, learning from a a life of experience like yours and and um, others out there because people feel a real need and a real passion. And I, I mean, obviously we both love encouraging homesteading and, and all that entails that, but the freedom of owning a business and entrepreneurship. I think is another a piece, another key in that. And people are just so hungry, um, but it is a journey. Hope, hopefully we can help them shorten it. And yeah, so it, let's, sure and, and I will tell you, you know, I do a lot of conference speaking, a lot of, you know, these homestead festivals are, you know, just popping up everywhere. And um, routinely I'll ask you, you got a room of five or 600 people. Uh, how many of you, if you could actually make a living on your homestead would leave your town job and do it. And all the time it's, way over half the hands go up. Now, some people love their work. They're really doing well. It's very, compa- you know, compatible with, with a homestead lifestyle. And some of them, you know, aren't interested. But I can tell you the yearning of the human spirit to uh, to be a butcher baker or candlestick maker, you know, on your own is, yeah. uh, is, truly, is truly powerful. And often homestead hobbies become the launch pad for, for initial little, you know, uh, toe dips into the, into a business. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the, one of the beautiful things, this is a little bit of a sideways, but today with the technology we have is a lot of people are able to take their work, you know, home. And that's a great transition because they got zoom. We've we've got all this technology and and more and more people are able to matter of fact, with both with the, the school of traditional skills, we're able to hire people that can work from home and do a job they love and yet pursue you know, their homesteading dream. So that's great. But then like you said, over half of those people are like, yeah, but I want the freedom of an entrepreneurial nut life. I want to turn this homesteading life into a living. And so let's dive into a little bit about the mindset of a business owner, entrepreneur, because I think one thing that people often don't realize is that there's more to learn than just a skill. There's more to learn than just how to raise hens and sell eggs, you know, profitably right. and profitably leans into some of those things to learn or, or whatever it is there's going to do. There's a mindset, just like there's a mindset to homestay, there's a mindset to a business person. 
that they need to learn some other skills and think about some other things, not just that um, trade, if you will. Yes. Well, there's a, there's a whole, there's a whole list of these. I mean, obviously think about your taxes. And so, and so for example, um, at our, you know, when, when we started, uh, remember I told you dad, dad was a, a tax accountant. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that we did was we started, we started a, a C corp as Polyface Incorporated and the, and, and the corporation, the business then rents, it rents the land from us. And so for Teresa and I, when we started out, um, our income was, um, was unearned income and therefore not subject to FICA tax. Mm -hmm. And that saved us thousands and thousands of dollars initially. And I know dad set up, he set up, for example, I know he was working with, um, I never knew who all his clients were, but I knew one of them was two, um, were two uh, uh, Mennonite, Mennonite ladies that ran a daycare center in their home. And he set them up this way so that the, the daycare center rented their home and their income then was not a salary. It was unearned income. And I mean, you can take a nominal salary just to not make any red flags, but, but, you know, you, um, you, you need, you need to think about taxes, all sorts of things regarding taxes, capital gains, depreciation, write-offs. And so, you know, get a good aggressive accountant who most of us, you know, don't, know enough about taxes especially business type things to be able to make these make these things so the thing the first item on my list is get a good accountant that that can that can um that that will be aggressive and design your your system so that it'll uh, minimize your taxes um of course closely related to that is is financial records yeah and and, and most most small businesses keep horrific financial records. And I was, you know, again, dad was an accountant. And so, uh, and so it, it, and so the financial records are all about categories. You can't just lump, for example, if you're raising pigs and chickens, you can't just have a, a category for feed. If you're buying feed, you need to have it separate for the layers, the broilers, the, anything that you're buying feed for, you know, you need to, um, if you're if you're buying um, fertilizer, uh, you know, and 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 I'm, this is not organic or inorganic. If you're buying soil amendments, um, that that needs to go into if you, if you're doing vegetables, separate your vegetable soil amendments from your pasture livestock soil amendments. The, what I'm getting at is categories. And right now on our farm, uh, Josh, I think we have, Teresa would tell me she keeps the books, but um, uh, I think we have over 200 categories, but, 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 but those categories are how you tease out your margins. Yeah. If you can't identify your enterprise expense and your enterprise income, you can't, you need to break off that individual enterprise. And I realize a lot of people, when they start, they might only have one enterprise. Okay. I get that. But, but often you have subsets of enterprises, uh, you know, very, very quickly. M most businesses, yes, they have a mothership, but then, but then they, they, they have other things. You know, if you're, if, if you're making candles, um, it would be easy to, you know, to, to break off between aromatic candles and um, uh, whatever, uh, utility candles, maybe, you know, if there's a power outage, uh, you know, those are two different lines of, you know, two different lines of product. So mm -hmm. uh, financial records are just so, so critical. And then, and then sales, marketing, who's going to do the sales and marketing? A lot of people are not natural people that, you know, they, they get the shutters and, and, and get chills, you know, the thought of, of making a, you know, making a call to a potential customer. So, um, so sales and marketing, a lot of times will not be you, you know, mm. it'll, it'll be a friend. It'll be somebody that has a skill in sales that, that enjoys the, the game of, of matching wits with a customer, you know, and, and finding one and, uh, you put, put them on a commission. Almost all sales are on a commission. So you're not obligated for, you know, for payment, if they sell more, you make more, they make more, you know, 
and uh, so sales and marketing is is a big deal because because many many small businesses um, are are just not good you know at sales and marketing, cash flow, okay, cash flow. I mean, almost all small businesses. Oh, let me let me back up. The most common reason that small businesses fail is not because they don't have a good service or a good skill or, you know, something good, a good product. It's because of cash flow. The, the bills are coming in faster than the incomes and there's some glitch. And especially with farming, when you're dealing with seasonality, uh, I mean, we dealt with this, Mike, early on, you know, the only thing we had was beef. So I'm starting to direct market and sell beef. And, uh, and then we added the chickens pretty quickly but the chickens were done in, in October as well. And so for our first several years, Teresa and I did not get any income between October and May. And we had to stretch that. We had to, we had to build up enough to make it through the winter. And then, then, so then what did I do? I started cutting firewood. Okay. Firewood was something I could do in the winter. That was when the market was because one of the first goals when you start a business is to become fully employed. Um, most of your services and products actually actually are are profitable, but they don't they don't make it they don't work um, they don't work because you're not spending enough time at profitable things. Mm -hmm. And and so and so when you so when you make when you make a calendar January through December. Put down where you're where you're busy and where you're not in your business. Where, you know, this business, am I going to be busy this month? This month, you know, where am I going to be busy? And then, and then, if you have a couple of months that are really, really low, and you say, "Well, my lands, you know, what am I going to do this month?" Well, think about something that could be done at that time that would bring that cash flow up so it's steady, you know, through the season. Don't add something where you're already busy. Yeah, that's one reason why we don't dairy. We don't dairy. Why? We've got the broiler chickens. They're a six-month seasonal on pasture program. If we did a if we did a seasonal grass-based dairy, we would be adding an enterprise when we're already almost too busy. Yeah. So so we want to add enterprises that that we can do, you know, off season. That, that's why woodworking. And and firewood, sawmills, those kind that that kind of off season winter work is so complementary to a livestock or a vegetable outfit. Um, and of course, if you're doing vegetables, you can season extend. Uh, that's another way, you know. So with with greenhouses and with root cellars, you can you can extend your season so that with a root cellar, you've got potatoes and cabbage and squash to sell all the way through the winter. And you don't have to finish in first of November and not have anything to sell until the first vegetables are ready in, in May. So, so cash flow is a big one. Customer service. You know, how are you going to interact with your customers? Which brings me to social media, email lists. Um, you know, a lot of us, certainly me, I'm not social media savvy. I, I don't, you know, I don't even have a smartphone. I've still got a flip phone. So what do I have to do? I have to team up. I have to partner with people. And when you're starting out, this can just be a friend. It can be a nephew, niece, a, a daughter, a son, okay? Somebody who's, you know, who's under 18 years old and social media savvy and have them set up a website, your social media, do a monthly blog. You start this, you start this story. And this story um, is, is, is what drives people uh, to you um, in that way. And, and finally, I would just say, you know, um, licenses and compliance. I mean, that is becoming a, a bigger issue these days. And, um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty, uh, ask, ask forgiveness, not permission, but, uh, but, but there, there are, there are things, there are things that you can really get, get, uh, in trouble about. Um, one of which is selling illegal meat. I mean, they will, they will get you, if you're if you're selling if you've got meat stamp not for sale because it's custom processed and you start selling that uh, T-bone steak by itself, let me tell you, 
um, you will get a visit and it will not be good. And so there are some minimal things. I mean, for example, when we, 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 uh, butchering chickens here, we, um, the health department wanted us to, uh, check the well, uh, for, for potable water. Hmm. And, um, and, and so, you know, we, that was one that we, we didn't fight on. We, you know, we, we didn't feel like it was, it was in our business interest to look at the health department and say, no, we don't think potable water is important. That, that doesn't, that doesn't mesh well, you know, with, with your, with your messaging. And so, you know, we got the water and it turned out we needed to put a, a U, so we got a UV filter on the water, a UV uh, light, ultraviolet light, and that kills coliforms and the water was good. It passed and we're, we're all good to go. So choose your hills, but that licensing and compliance, um, you, you know, some, some things are, some things are, are important to, uh, to jump through some hoops if it just just so you're not sitting there looking over your shoulder every day yeah. i mean that, that that's that's not a fun way to live no and those aren't i mean you got to be you got to be really choosy about your battles there if you're gonna yeah. start up and get a successful business going you you, yeah. you got to be careful where you choose your battles we may not like certain things and and uh but yeah your goal is to get this thing off the ground right and, and yeah. generate income Man, there, there's there's a whole lot there. I want to go back and revisit a couple things for people. You're, you're just touching on so many great things. Um, one is the need to set up and be intentional about a business structure. You mentioned the C Corp. There's there's different structures people may not realize. And a lot of times they just go the self, what we'd call the self-employed route, right? They don't really create any entity. And so you know, what you're alluding to is, is not just getting good accounting, but getting somebody that can help you set up a proper entity that is going to save you money, going to shelter, you're going to do a multiple, th multiple things. There are tools out there that are very yes. worth using. And I, I don't think Joel, you or I can say which one's best for which person, but, but look at it, think about it and find a structure that works for you. Yeah. There's, there's S there's sub S corporations. There's of course, when we, when we started uh, Polyface back in 1982, L LLCs didn't exist. LLCs mm -hmm. have come on since then, wow. and, and 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 so 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 we now, um, in the last ten years, we've bought some land. We bought a we bought a lot with a house on it nearby for you know for staff housing. Um, so we we have we have a, a an LLC that that owns property, um, and again. Polyface can rent that LL. Polyface can rent that land, and that then pays the mortgage, mm -hmm. and it 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 reduces our tax bite. Um, uh, we we co-own a, a slaughterhouse, and that's an LLC as well. So the L, the LLC, as you know, has really come on. It's fairly, it's fairly simple to to um, to get, and um, yeah, the the reason you want that is to create a um, a veil a veil of protection between your business and your your wealth um yeah. i don't know if you've ever been sued we've been sued and um and i'm telling you what um when you're sued it is not fun and so whatever you can do to create a it was a it was it was a wreck one of our our delivery drivers had a wreck and yeah. uh, an ambulance an ambulance chaser came after us um for you know a million dollars um but again um by having having L, uh, uh, separate business interests it it protects your liability and that's a that's a really good thing have you, have you ever read, I, I'm assuming you have, but maybe not. Have you ever read Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow Quadrant? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Long time ago when it first came out. Yeah. Well, and I, and I would encourage everybody here to read it. It was very foundational for me. But it one of the things, I one of my big takeaways, Joel, is just these things. It teaches you how to think like a business person instead of just an employee yes. or even a self-employed person. And he makes a distinguishment between... Yes employed self-employed versus a business person and then an investor which is to the side here but um it's just what you're talking about and learning to separate things out and there's a lot of advantage advantages to that business advantages legal protections like you're talking about 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you can, and you can shift, you can shift monies around, um, you know, so, so our, our business fiscal year, our, our polyface fiscal year is not on the calendar year. Our, our, our polyface fiscal year is April one to March 31 to March 30, <laughs> March 31. And, and that's of course a quarter off of personal taxes. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can move money around to, uh, to avoid taxes, yeah, dump it back in. We can make a loan. I, mean, I don't want to get down too far in the rabbit hole, but, but again, but again, your, your entities um, enable you to shift. I mean, th this is what, this is what the Rockefeller foundation does. This is what, you know, this is what these outfits do is they, they have all these entities that they're able to, um, you know, to, to shift monies around. Yeah, and then there are legal strategies, and and Absolutely. people. If you're starting a business, you need to understand there are tools that are available to you. Do they cost a little money to set up? Yes, but do they save you a ton of money in the long run and protect you? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Let's um, let's talk cash flow for a minute. I I think that is just huge. Um, as people are learning to understand financial statements, they need to learn how to read a profit and loss and a balance sheet a little bit. You need to learn, at least have somebody keep good records for you, right? And learn to right. analyze those. One thing that people don't realize I've found, Joel, is that people will see that they're profitable on the books and they'll see profit. But if your cash flow isn't working well, you can still have major problems and, and sink your business because of the timing you were talking about, about the cash coming right. in. Right. Can, can you expound on that a little bit? Because that's a, that can, that can be a trap. You can think, wow, I'm profitable. I'm showing that I'm, I'm making money on the chickens, but depending on when that cash is going in versus coming in versus when the expenses are going out and, and how that cash is moving can be tricky. Yeah. So, so mapping, mapping out. So, you know, I talked about a, a labor, a labor flow chart. You can also do a cash flow chart, mm -hmm. and 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 you you can look at what whatever your whatever your product is. Um, you know you you can look when when is that income coming in, and when are the expenses? When are the cost of goods uh, coming due to get that done? Mm -hmm. And um and 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 so there there are there are there are investments that you can make that appear to be a profitable investment but if the cost of that investment has to be paid before the income comes in <laughs> excuse me it might not be it might not be a good investment um even though it might look good on paper it might it might snowball into a real problem uh, when the, when the payments are due. So, so this is just a, a pretty, uh, simple thing. You know, I'm obviously we're, we're talking to, you know, people that are kind of starting, you know, we're mm -hmm. not talking, about, we're not talking here to people that are running a, uh, you know, a $4 million business. Okay. Right. <laughs> and, and, and so, so this, this cash flow thing is a lot easier, um, you know, to, to, to do when you're real small. Yeah, it is, but you got to mm -hmm. know it so that you understand because every business is going to, you're going to have to spend money. You're going to have to spend energy. Some of it's your labor, but you still got to spend cash dollars for materials, for chicks, for feed, whatever it is you're doing. And you got to have a plan for that cycle of spending and income coming in and spending, especially when you're getting started. And hopefully you've got some money in the bank, which could be a whole nother discussion point here. What do you need well, to get started? That, that that's exactly as you started down this path that's where i was headed was when people asked me you know we're, we're gonna make the jump you know what do we need and 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 so there's always a lag between your capitalization you know maybe you need to to build a build a structure uh we'll stay with the chickens you need to buy a plucker and a and a scalder you're gonna have you know seven or eight thousand dollars and in you know some stainless steel tables and some plumbing and you know <clears throat> a roof and and you're to, to get started. And so um, that's why, that's why the, one of the biggest um, temptations I see with homesteaders 
is they want as much acreage as they can get. So they got this little nest egg. Mm. They got this little nest egg and they put it they, and they buy as as big an acreage as they can get. Mm -hmm. 15, 20, 30 acres. Okay. Sometimes a hundred acres. All right. They, they put all, and, and then suddenly there's no capital left to capitalize the enterprises they want to do. And I mean, if you want to build a hoop house, you know, a, a tall tunnel, you know, those things are, if you have any kind of size at all, you know, they're going to be a few thousand dollars. Um, any, any kind of livestock facility barn, I mean, goodness, a tractor, uh, you know, anything like this is going to take money. So assume, so I encourage people to, if you've got a, a you know, a $400,000 nest egg, put 200 in the land and that saves you 200 <clears throat> to be able to build fence and tall tunnels and, and, you know, a, a, a refrigerator and processing equipment and, you know, whatever you need to get to get this thing up and running, uh, you know, a, a, a sawmill, a woodworking saw, whatever, you know, chainsaws. I mean, every, you know, I mean, a shop, just, just outfitting the, the rudimentary tools of a shop with, with, a, you know, chainsaw, post hole diggers come along, jacks, uh, you know, it, it it's, you can, you can go down to Lowe's and spend, you know, $4,000 in a heartbeat, get some box end wrenches and some, you know, uh, channel locks and vice grips and boy, you know, fence stretchers and come alongs and, you know, tie downs and ratchets and oh my goodness, it, you know, it goes fast. So, so, um, uh, buy as you can all, you can always either add to your holdings <clears throat> or you can trade up. Yeah. And, and, and most of the time, if you invest four or five years in your homestead, and you have actually made it really attractive and pretty, and you've got some fruit trees going and things. You can normally, maybe you know, maybe you built a little pond and okay. Think think about aesthetics. I mean, um, one of my one of my my, my forestry mentor <clears throat> was a guy named Bill Brownworth. He drove he drove a, a tank in the Battle of the Bulge in, in World War II. He got out of he got out of the military, World War II. Guy that no money, no nothing. All right, but he he's a born salesman. So he went to work for still um, still chainsaw, you know, um, smart still. equipment. All right, as a salesman in New Jersey, he was able to buy a um, a very very small like you know thirty acre place in in the in nineteen fifty. Okay. And he built a couple ponds. He um, he upgraded the woodlot, the trees, turned into a real pretty place. And in just about six years, he doubled his money and bought a uh, a two hundred acre place in Pennsylvania. When it did the same thing, built a couple ponds, um, thinned out the trees, planted some trees. You know, prettied it up. About seven years doubled or tripled his money. When I met him, he was, I don't know what, in his late fifties, um, back in the, you know, I met him in the, in the, in about 1980 or 81. And, um, and he, he had upgraded to where at that point he bought three large properties here in our County, which is one of the reasons I met him. Um, and, and, and it had taken him, you know, 25 years, but he just, he just pretty up a place, doubled his money, pretty up a place, doubled his money. And, and I think, I think too often um, newbies, newbies especially are already intimidated by 10 acres. And, and they're thinking of this as a, you know, well, this, this is my one chance in a lifetime. No, no, no. Land comes up for sale all the time, all the yeah. time. Land, land is, is, it comes up for sale. And so, so a lot of the people who have actually moved to, you know, uh, uh, bigger places have done it incrementally. But by doing that, you hold on to your nest egg, you hold on to your capitalization. So if you need a piece of equipment, um, you know, you're, you're not, you're not uh, press. 
I went on too long on that, but anyway, it, it's, it's a great story. He, he, he was, he was my, he was my forestry mentor mentor. I mean, I, I, I worked with him. Uh, you know, he was just, he was, he was bigger than life and just wonderful. And, and his story of just slowly and progressively, you know, to where, to where, when I knew him, he had, you know, he owned a thousand acres yeah. of, of nice, you know, Virginia land. Yeah. Well, it, you, you bring out, and I mean, not everybody's, you know, the land and real estate investments one way, not everybody's going to do that, but I, I think you draw out the need to have an expectancy of it taking some time for a business to work. And, and people, as you know, are motivated right now. They're passionate. They're wanting to make changes, but there are some things that just take a little bit of time of wise investment in, you know, in, in the land you're buying and whatever the business is you're pursuing and, and how you go about it. Do you see over the years, you know, maybe in some of these, whether it's, you know, raising chickens or beef or, or, you know, market gardening, do you see a time frame that it takes for people on average, you know, two years, three years, five years to get from startup to, um, you know, maybe not there, wherever there is, whatever the end goal of success is, but to get up and running and um, bringing in income that's helping you support yourself reasonably well or completely, you know, do, do you see any trends or guidelines there? I know there are some in business in general, but yeah. within this world that we're talking about, um yeah. well, what do people expect if they're going to try to start up a business because they're not going to start it up and six months later you're making a good profit and living off of it that that's oh. going to be the hollywood or or you know uh youtube exception right somebody that just launches ahead yes those happen but that's the dream that's not the common reality yeah no it, it's not it's not and as you know our culture our culture has become very impatient yeah. Uh, you know, we want it all. We want it all yesterday. Um, in general, I encourage people that are that are really serious about this <clears throat> to be to have a nest egg big enough to live on for two years. So you so you 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 can you can get your groceries, um, you know, keep your car running. I mean, you know, uh, and, and, and you can survive for two years that will get. And, and if you if you can survive for two years and be a 100% devoted to what you're doing, you'd be surprised how fast you can learn if you're not distracted. Um, <clears throat> what this means is, you know, we're back to the Dave Ramsey thing. You, you know, you're not going to eat out. You're not going to go on Caribbean cruises. No vac. I mean, Teresa and I, Teresa and I did not take, well, we don't take vacations. I mean, we, we love what we do. We need to go anywhere. But when I want to get away, I come home, you know, um, but, but, um, you know, we didn't take a true, you know, vacation, vacation, uh, for probably seven or eight years, you know, and then, then we, we took a little bit away. We, and for us, I can tell you for us, it was the end of our third year that we were able to breathe. So when I left outside employment, September 24, 1982, we had enough to live on for one year, but remember we were already 20 years into this, into the homesteading. So we had a lot of good, we had a lot of good, whatever, skill uh, uh, under our, under our, and 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 we had connections. We, we lived in the community for 20 years. So people knew us when I walked into a store, you know, or walk, you know, we weren't, we weren't moving to, you know, to Tennessee and plopping down with, you know, a hundred thousand other, you know, homestead refugees from California you know, expecting it to, you know, to, to materialize. And so we had one year and, um, and because we were living frugally, you know, we drove a $50 car. We, um, I mean, to show you how frugal dad was, he, he didn't, he didn't want a pickup truck. He didn't want to have two vehicles. Um, and so he bought a, remember he's a tax accountant. So he, you know, he's driving around to these, he wears a, you know, a suit and a tie and all this he bought a 1957 four door Plymouth for $50 from a neighbor. Took all the door. This is in the 60s, okay? No, no car inspection. So this is before car inspection. This is when we were a free country. And I took all the doors off, all the seats out, sat on a, a overturned bucket, and 
drove to a client's in this old 1957 Plymouth. And, and, and when you take all the seats and everything out of a, out of an old car like that, it, it's, it's got a compartment the size of a pickup truck and it's even <laughs> covered. And so he, he would get calves and pigs and chickens. And that was basically our pickup truck, but it actually doubled as a, as a town car as well. And so those kinds of how do you live just cutting your expenses to almost nothing has everything to do with how long this nest egg will go. When you come to homesteading, leave your city, leave your city stuff behind and let your homestead, you know, the frogs in the creek, that's your new entertainment. The, you know, the, the picnic table by the, you know, by the edge of the woods, that's your new entertainment. And, and it's, it's a completely changed mindset but you don't need to pay for entertainment. You don't need to pay for recreation. You know, trust me, the first time the cows get out, you're going to have all the recreation you can stand for, you know, for a few hours. So, so, um, so en enjoy it, but that enjoyment doesn't require a lot of money. So, you know, I, I, I like, I like uh, a two year nest egg, but it does make a big difference. Um, your, 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 your savvy, and your, you know, your, your experience level in whatever you're going to do. Yeah. And making the most of your efforts, whether it's dollars spent or steps taken or yeah. energy consumed, you know, kind of like that car, it's like stacking functions before we knew what permaculture was really. <laughs> right. right. Oh yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's um, talk about something a minute that was, it's been implicit overall in this conversation, but you haven't said it directly. And, and that is a diversity of revenue streams you know we we know like if we're working on the land you know regeneratively we want uh diverse ecosystems uh diverse animal systems what about a business how important is it to develop multiple um income streams versus focusing on one and then the follow-up to that's going to be then how do you start right yeah yeah, yeah. so so um, innovation is expensive because innovation inherently comes with failure. And, uh, and so you cannot, you cannot innovate in too many things at once or you'll get frustrated and you'll go bankrupt. So my suggestion is um, what, what do you think right now is a potential business? You know, what is your, well, in business, we call this an unfair advantage. What do you know how to do? Um, what does your area, uh, what does your area need? Um, what, what's your unfair advantage that you are uniquely able to do or know about uh, that, that others don't know? And, and start there first, uh, because if your unfair advantage creates a firewall, a firewall of competition uh, protection against everybody who would, you know, jump in and do what you do. And so, so think about needs, think about what you want to do, what you like to do. Um, and it's okay to have multiples, but pick one, pick one and concentrate on it get good at it. You know, the old um, mastery concept of, of 10 years and 10,000 hours. I mm -hmm. mean, you alluded to that a little bit without saying the 10,000 hours, but you, you can't shortcut mastery. Mastery requires time. Uh, you know, um, I mean, I can teach anybody how to gut a chicken in, you know, about five minutes, but you don't become a master until you uh, until you got a, a stewing hen, you know, uh, an old rooster uh, on a on a cold day, on a hot day, on a rainy day, on a, you know, when the wind is blowing, um, you know, all these, you know, when, when the when the water pump went down and you're and you're trying to just make it happen with carrying water and sprinkle cans, um, it's all those those nuances that that create mastery, and so what happens is. You develop your mastery in in one uh, in one item or service, and then that finances or subsidizes 
your next enterprise. Now, obviously, if you can't get one thing profitable, you know, it can't subsidize anything else. So, so you know, our, our discussion about profitability, and we haven't even mentioned the word margins, mm -hmm. but margins are absolutely critical. Uh, you know, you, you have to know what your, so a margin, you've got your direct costs and your overheads, okay? What I call enterprise costs and overheads. So overheads are things like, taxes, insurance, um, you know, uh, uh, anything, anything that goes, anything that you would have, whether you had a business or not. Direct expenses are things that you only buy because you're running this business. If we weren't, if we weren't raising eggs, we wouldn't buy layer feed. So, so um, your, your margin, your enterprise margin is your costs, is your, your income of that enterprise minus your direct costs. And that should be um, 30 to 40%. Now that's not, <coughs> excuse me, that's not, your that's not your profit because that is going to go to your overheads right so the idea is so th there's only three ways to increase profit you can reduce your expenses you can increase your price so you can reduce your your costs increase your price or if you have a positive margin you can increase turnover those are the only three ways you can actually increase profit. And, and, and of course, turnover is how Tyson does it. You know, Tyson doesn't make, but whatever, a dime on a chicken. Okay. But they're doing billions of chickens. Right. And so it works. Um, and so, so this is why your, your accounting categories are so important. So you can tease out, you can separate the various, expense and income streams and allocate them <clears throat> to the various enterprises. We we've tried, we've tried numerous things in the past. We we've, we've tried pheasants. We've tried numerous things in the past and, and, and for two or three years and give them up. We, we, we couldn't, we couldn't make them work. Okay. Sure. Uh, and, and we're pretty creative. All right. Some things won't work for you. They just won't. And so, you know, give it a year or two, you know, do all you can. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And then you can, you know, go do something else. So, so, I, I, so yeah. So, the, so the question was about diversity and yes, um, the more income streams you can have, the more stable your whole business becomes because the single hardest part in in sales in marketing is finding a new customer that's the hardest part if you have a happy customer buying you know flowers they say well what else can i get can i get blackberries can i get um you know uh, decorative grapevine wreaths can i get you know uh uh whatever what you know children's woodworking toys whatever um but but the hardest part in marketing is 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 penetrating our hurried harried frenzied you know flustered lives of people and saying stop here look at me you know here you know i got my hand up i'm, I'm here look at me and but once you have their attention they're immediately going to ask hey i'm I'm happy with this product or service. What else do you guys offer? Yeah. And, and and those then become very, very cheap, cheap marketing sales. I, I think I've heard you say it somewhere. I think it was you. Um, it's easier to get a hundred customers spending a thousand dollars each than it is to get a thousand customers spending a hundred dollars. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's far. Yeah. And that that's where this uh, multiple income streams comes in. 
Yeah. So you're you're always looking at you know what what is another what is a complementary um, income stream. And, yeah. You know, figuring out how to do it. But but to recap it, so so we can cover a couple other things before we run out of time. Diversity is key. It's good for long term successful business. But to start, I think what I heard you saying is find your sweet spot, find your unfair advantage at that place where you can hit the market. You're good at it. Get that down, master it. That gives you momentum, right. and it's going to give you bandwidth both in energy and capital to then start spinning off and finding those other, you know, diversities in your revenue stream. Yeah, that's for sure. One, one of the one of the uh, most important equities, the most important business equity you can have, <clears throat> is your own confidence that you can actually do this. Yeah, have to, uh, got to believe that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've got to believe that. And so, you know, Dave Ramsey has his snowball effect, and 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 what you've just described is is the snowball effect in in reverse, um, where where you start with something, a prototype, start with something small, and you you get it uh, efficient, profitable, and it, it's running, and then, and then you can you, you can add you know complementary things, and and a lot of the time. The complementary things will just they'll just appear while you're listening to customers or or if you have a need. For example, for example, we didn't have pigs for years and years. We didn't have pork. <clears throat> so I was at this uh, conference and I saw a presentation about uh, rare breeds of pigs by the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy. And I'm sitting there and a slide comes up and there's these, you know, red wattle pigs. But what excited me was the pigs were obviously standing on a steaming pile of horse manure. And and the pig had, you know, all this manure stuff all over his nose. It was like an epiphany for me. Huh, of course, we don't need to double handle compost and make these windrow compost piles. We'll just let pigs do it. And I came home and I bought two pigs. And uh, put them in to do the compost, and it was it was it was marvelous. It was fantastic, and so um, so we we got into pigs. I'm not sure what year that was. That I mean, we were probably I'm going to say, hmm, we might have been we might have been full time here for eight or nine years before we started with pigs, and but the thing was. <clears throat> When we got the pigs and we sold them then, it was easy to sell two pigs, you know, to our, uh, we had all these customers. Well, they liked the pork so much, everybody wanted pork. So then, mm -hmm. so then we moved the pigs from a, what's called a whole on. So a whole, a whole onic business is a business that you start to salvage a waste stream from something else. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so, so the, the, the reason the whole onic business works is because you don't have to put very much expense in it. In other words, those our eggmobile is a perfect example of a whole onic business. The chickens eliminate the need for headgate work, um, grubicides, parasiticides. They spread out the cow patties. If if those chickens never laid an egg, they would still be beneficial because of what they do from a livestock sanitation and fertility management program. <clears throat> so the eggs are basically cream. Now, the eggs, people liked them so much they wanted more eggs. Well, we didn't we didn't need that many, you know, chickens to go behind the cows. So we began raising chickens on the, you know, uh, in the in the pasture in the called the Millennium Feather Net. Um, but that is not a whole on that is a business and the egg mobile is a whole on business because it is taking cow manure and and bugs that the cows expose converting it into eggs so there's 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 very little actual cost involved um but the but the the millennium feather net where it's a thousand chickens and they're moved every couple of days on pasture we feed them uh more that that is a that is actually a, a business, 
and 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 so you know that a lot of the times your next your next enterprise will be something that you're you're seeing oh we could use that waste stream and do this with it or it's something that the customer your customers are coming back saying i like this and this i'd really like you to do this could you do this you know you're raising um, you know, uh, uh, zucchini and yellow crookneck squash. I'd really love butternuts. Can you raise a fall crop of butternuts for me? You know, and that's a lot of the times the way the, you know, the way the, uh, the diversification actually goes. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very natural succession, if you will. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, we're, I know we're getting down on time. I wanted to cover one or two other things and you travel obviously all the time, all over the place. You're meeting a lot of people. You really have your finger on the pulse of what's happening. That combined with your own, just uh, you know, rich experience in farming. Are there are there businesses you think today, maybe in the general market, are there certain startups that that, that are worth the homesteader thinking about? So I'm looking to give people ideas. Or are there some things that, in general, and obviously you got very regional skill specific regional areas. And so that's hard to address, but in general, are you seeing things that are suited for homesteaders that there's maybe common need for in the market? And on the other side, are you seeing things that are maybe popular um, that people are getting into? That's a bit of a trap. That's a little dangerous that they need to think. I, I don't know, but it, 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 that would be the flip side of the coin, you know? Yeah. So, um, so the the opportunities, I think, are are the the ones that I see on the horizon um, that I think are are completely unexploited right now are are caregiving farms, farms that uh, their income is actually caregiving. This could be elder care, it could be daycare, it could be autistic autistic adults. Uh, I can't tell you how many startups I'm I'm seeing that are in this caregiving space. So the actual and in Europe, in Europe, they've been doing this for years and years. Um, and 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 they they have you know healthcare and and they actually uh, promote non institutionalized care caregiving. And so there are many farmers in Europe who pad their dairies and stuff with you know brain injured. Uh, autistic, uh, you know, different kinds of individuals that that are on some sort of a, a health care, you know, program, um, whether it's insurance or government, there it's mainly government. Uh, but 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 a lot of these people can can do a lot of things. They can put away eggs. They can, you know, they're they're not stupid and they're not, you know, dumb. But 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 they just they just they can't quite function in a normal in a hmm. normal workplace situation. And and they are perfectly happy to, you know, clean out some cow stalls or or uh, or or plant. Th this is not demeaning. This is actually respecting people who otherwise would just be in, in our country. We would just lock them away in the institution and 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 give them drugs. There, they actually promote and embrace deinstitutionalizing, getting them out where they can actually be honored. Uh, it, it, into something that they can do, and so I think I what I'm seeing here, and and you know, uh, Josh, we're our our culture in the next ten years, we are going into a shock mm -hmm. of of autism and um and and uh, the the baby boomers um th that are that are aging out, and um our our healthcare costs are just skyrocketing yeah and so um if you've got some savvy if one of you is a registered nurse if one of you uh you know is a physical therapist if if th there are there are people that can bring skills to the rural setting that can offer incredible uh, opportunities in in care for their community in in a in a farm setting um uh, by the way, an, another another one in, in the same space is delinquents, juvenile delinquents. Um, people, I'm, I'm seeing uh, more and more 
um, Christians start um, farms that are basically halfway houses where they're taking uh, inmates transitioning and 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 so the 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 so the farm income the income is not production the income is some sort of counseling care transitional thing that insurance or social security or something pays for and 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 the farm production itself simply becomes a a conducive habitat for that kind of tra transition or, or that kind of care. And uh, mm. I think as much as this country is spending on health care, uh, I think that that is a really, really a burgeoning space. Addictions, addi you know, drug addictions, uh, yeah. all this. We, we just have massive. And so if you have, if you have a heart, if you have a heart for this now, obviously, you know, uh, some of us aren't aren't we're not conducive to that, okay? Or or you know, or you you don't sure. want your family invaded, or you know, whatever. But but there are a lot of situations where you can you can enter this on a very small scale. I mean, look at foster care. Foster care pays what is it? Um, in Virginia, I think foster care pays three thousand dollars a month. Um, and we, we, we know, we know a couple that's homesteading and basically their income is foster care and, and, and they, they take two, three, four of these and the state pays them. Uh, and you know, they can, these, you know, not all of them work out. And of course it's a, it's a revolving thing, but you know, uh, a lot of these young people thrive when they when they see the miracle of a garden and the miracle of a calf being born and, and get to gather eggs and, and cook and work in the, I mean, there are a lot of things here that are, that are um, palliative, uh, palliative that a homestead can offer. We, we know that. And so I think this is an opportunity that a lot of people are not examining um, that have a heart for it that can, that can really change the financial trajectory. Wow, that, that's those are just some beautiful concepts that that uh, improve the quality of life of people, especially of, of some of these people groups that have a not good quality of life. What what an opportunity! Yeah, um, I, I'm I'm fairly mind blown at the moment. So I'm so just spinning that 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 is just really neat. Those are some neat ideas, and they it, it kind of ties into what was going to be my my last question or last thought for you, and that is. I mean, it ties right into it. Do people need to, you know, make an income directly from the homesteading activities, which you're saying no, but let's explore that because I think a lot of people, they're going homesteading, they're they're looking for a business. So they naturally just think I'm going to sell eggs, I'm going to sell beef, I'm, I'm going to do a market garden, all, all great things, but we only need so many people selling beef and so many people raising market gardens somewhere you I don't think we have balance right now but somewhere in an area you're going to hit balance we need people doing other things yeah. so does it have to be part of your homesteading activities to live a homesteading life and start a business that's based out of home and, and out of that life that you're seeking yeah no I, I I don't think so I don't think so at all I mean again my dad was an accountant he you know, he worked out of the home client clients came here. He'd, he'd go to their home, but um, you know, he, he worked out of the home. Mom was a school teacher. Well, that wasn't very conducive to being at home. Um, but there are a lot of things. Um, you know, we, we have a, we have a shop here on the farm, a very, very well-equipped shop. Cause we've got, we've got a lot of equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we're not a we're not a backyard operation. We've got whatever ten tractors or something. You know, I mean, we're this is a a, a serious deal. But this shop, the the guy the guy that handles that shop, um, fixes things in our community when he's not working for Polyface. And so in the evening or weekends, he'll come in there and he'll do a break job for a neighbor. He'll do things um, now. Now, you know that's our shop. But but if you have mechanical ability, everybody needs things that can be fixed. That they've all got things that can be fixed, and um, and so 
think about acquiring skills. I mean, perhaps, you know, if you're thinking about this, the best investment you could make is go to some vo you know, some vocational courses in mechanics or or HVAC or um, you know, or or learn how to plumb a plumb a house, um, get your electrical I mean, all the trades, as you know, Josh, all the trades are all aging out. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's good money. I mean, those guys, if you, you know, you buy it, you hire an electrician or a plumber, they're not charging you 20 bucks an hour. I mean, these guys are 50, 60, you yep. know, they're, they're, and, and, and if you read the book, the millionaire next door, <laughs> you know, you know that virtually all millionaires are blue collar. They're not white collar professionals. Yep. They're blue collar. And yeah. so, so um, yeah, learn how to, fix things, build things, repair things, grow things. Um, and, and you'll be, you'll be in good shape. So no, I, I am very much uh, a believer in bring your skill to the homestead. Let your life experience drive your business opportunity. And if something develops from your actual homestead production, wonderful. That's, that's just cream on your dream. Okay. That's just cream on your dream. But, but the, the safest thing is to leverage your 10, 15, 20 year vocational experience first and then, and then see how the homestead develops. <laughs> you know, you asked, you asked early on a, a question um, about what's the, what's the biggest uh, whatever uh, mistake or or you know we're we're and and, and um, I would simply say the biggest mistake on that is um, is exotics um, llamas alpacas uh, a, a, a horse uh, these are expensive exotics. And they're exotics for a reason. They're very costly. And so one of the things about being a business is you've got to, you've got to trim, you've got to prune down your druthers. You got to prune down your druthers, at least initially, um, so that you focus with laser focus attention on, 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 um, on, on the successful enterprise at hand. And you know, later on, you could, you know, you could have something warm and fluffy. Okay. But, uh, but the biggest mistake I see is, is people getting too wrapped up emotionally and economically in warm fuzzies and fluffies. And then that becomes, that becomes a distraction. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I think it's a, a great closing thought. In, in what you mentioned there about not, I think you said not throwing away, you know, 10, 15 years of knowledge of experience. What a great leaping off point to think about if, if as we exit this conversation and you guys listening or thinking about a business, how do you take your past life experiences, your past career, as you're moving towards a homestead life, maybe an entrepreneurial life? How do you take those and instead of tossing them out, and go going and which we're doing right we're, we're going for a new life a lot of people are in this homestaying life and, and a new life maybe in business but don't toss all that out how do you apply it how do you capitalize it how do you use it to propel yourself forward to drive a potential business from the home and from the homestead that's powerful yeah it, it is you're 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 leveraging it you're leveraging it not leaving it yeah i think I think that's a that's a real uh, critical advantage for, for yeah. homes. I, I think so. Well, this Joel, this has been a fun, rich uh, conversation. I hope everybody out there has enjoyed. Um, you guys watching, listening, you can um, get more information at the blog. There will be a link uh, below in the notes. You can go check out the blog post. Um, I want to invite you to come see Joel speak at the Modern Homesteading Conference this summer in Idaho, second year. Wasn't that a blast, Joel, last year? Oh, my. Yeah, fantastic. And Melissa Melissa tells me that uh, it's going to double in size this year. 
I knew it was getting bigger. Doubling is going to be huge. Wow. And what a lot of good energy and, and fun. Oh, yeah. People. So, yeah. Uh, we, we, yeah, we want to invite you guys to come check that out. Of course, uh, you can learn more about what Joel's doing at polyfacefarms.com. And Joel, you've got a course called Farm Like a Lunatic that I think is a, a business course around farming. Is that right? Tell us a little bit about that before we go. Well, yeah, it, it's not primarily business. There's a lot of business in it. And basically, okay. we we are we it's a it's a video curriculum where we start with we start with you know a raw canvas. Uh, where where do you get land? What are you looking for? How do you develop a landscape? And now we're into each enterprise, uh, and we're gradually working through all of our different enterprises, and and doing a you know, doing a video uh, curriculum on each on each of the different species and the different enterprises. Okay, well, very cool. Sounds very educational. So if, if uh, that's something that's interesting to you guys, that'll be in the show notes or on the blog post, go check that out. Joel, it's been awesome hanging with you. Everybody else, been great. And um, we'll see you soon. Goodbye.